So, as you know, China Start is our flagship short-term program for entrepreneurs. CKGSB also offers a degree program for those who are interested in studying full-time. Our 14-month MBA program has convened some of the brightest talents from China and around the world. It has provided students with a life-changing experience, both professionally and personally, as they join a lifelong network. From gaining a deeper understanding of China and learning the tools needed to become a successful business leader, to overcoming personal challenges and transitioning into new careers, the MBA program was a turning point for many of our students' lives. To capture this journey, we have published a book titled Changing Careers, Changing Lives, featuring 23 MBA alumni from different countries and backgrounds who share a common goal to accelerate their careers to a global level. The book follows their journeys as they come from a wide range of countries such as the UK, Italy, Brazil, India, to China to gain the knowledge and connections they need to succeed. It is my great pleasure to launch this book today at this event. More so, I am honored to be joined here today by our MBA alumni, Rory, who was featured in the book. Rory is the founder of Voodoo Chicken uh, and Glowsave, amongst many. He founded his very first venture when he was 15 years old. Rory spent 14 months immersed in the heart of Beijing with our MBA program after receiving the Sir Tom Hunter Scholarship. I'd also like to invite Travis Ralph Donaldson, who is our China Start alum and founder of Manfen, formerly known as Perfect Score. In his time on this crash course into China's startup ecosystem, Travis connected with some of China's top VCs who have helped launch his AI language app into a multi-million pound company. Okay, so to start off, I uh, would just like you guys to introduce yourselves, the companies or ventures that you're running, um, and what okay. they are, and how you came to finding, founding the company that you run. Yeah, do you want me to start? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm Travis Ralph Donaldson, I'm founder and CEO of Manfun EdTech. Uh, we gamify language learning, and we also offer some intelligent AI feedback system. Um, basically, I studied uh, Japanese and teaching English as a foreign language for my undergraduate degree. Uh, I really struggled to, <laughs> to uh, learn the complex Chinese characters because they have a very strict stroke order. And uh, I didn't really have the discipline or motivation to really study for hours a day doing the uh, root memorization. Um, so I developed a, a gamified platform for my own study, uh, which I really enjoyed. And I integrated some uh, intelligent handwriting recognition and feedback. Um, I realized soon that uh, this was actually better than what was commercially available. So I then took this to my university. Um, we have a, a startup accelerator at the University of Southampton called Future Worlds. I showed them the prototype that I developed and they absolutely loved it. So then I ended up pitching at a ECS Dragon's Den event and we secured um, 50K pre-seed funding from that. Uh, from that I've built a team of five people, including my CEO, uh, Yu Jing Liu. And, uh, we basically did the China Start program in October, and uh, this was absolutely a, a fantastic opportunity. So I pitched to over 800 investors there, and um, we received a formal offer of seed investment uh, three weeks ago for um, 5 million RMB for 10% of our Chinese subsidiary. And we then took that to UK VCs, and we're now raising uh, 2.24 million seed round funding. And um, my name is Rory Bate-Williams. Um, I have a business that brings people together and gives them a good time. It's a very unglamorous business because it's a food business. Uh, it's called uh, Voodoo Chicken and Spice. And uh, we aim to be the five guys of the grilled chicken market. Um, we've been operating in a kind of proof of concept model for a year and a half now. Um, we uh, cater to some of the biggest events in London and also at music festivals around the United Kingdom. Uh, and we're planning to open our first quick service restaurant uh, in December this year. Um, I did the Chung Kong MBA in 2013 14, um, some, well, quite, quite some time ago now. Um, but that 
that experience is still with me every day because I feel that it changed my life. Now, Rory and Travis, both of you have never been to China. Um, what, what made you decide to, in your case, go and do a 14-month-long MBA and, in your case, enter into the China market? Mm -hmm. um, well, for me, uh, Boji contacted me on LinkedIn. <laughs> that was my first point of contact. Uh, he mentioned that he was doing a talk at an event in London. We were actually abroad at the time, and we opened a dialogue with uh, CKGSB and sent them a pitch deck. And then we realized quite quickly that 80% of our users were actually based in China. So that's Chinese people studying Japanese language. So even that small kind of esoteric market was still bigger than the rest of the world. So we knew that we really needed to focus on uh, developing in China. So we thought we'd take a risk and, and fly out there for the China Start program. And then for me, again, it's quite some time ago now, but I guess I had a very entrepreneurial start to my career. Uh, I started my own company, uh, and then I had a, a unique opportunity where I worked with the CEO of the UK's largest food company for a year and a half. Um, so I was shadowing this business leader, um, who was also a very uh, entrepreneurial person, um, still owning 100% of his company. Um, and through that experience, I felt that I had an incredible amount of practical uh, business knowledge and, and business experience. But uh, I felt that um, I was lacking the, the theoretical background that might speed up my own decision making in, in business scenarios uh, and, and also increase my own confidence uh, in running a business. Um, so that's why I started looking for MBA education. And for me, it was a no-brainer to look to the east. Um, I'd say primarily because um, I thought if I was going to do an MBA, I would want to um, get the most personal learning as well as academic learning. And I feel that you achieve that by, by pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. So to me, um, pursuing an MBA in Europe or, or the US would have been a very familiar experience that, dare I say, would have been quite easy. Um, an MBA in China was a whole world um, where I initially felt very uncomfortable, but as a result, um, you know, learnt more than I could have learnt anywhere else. Can you tell us a little bit about the discomfort that you first felt when you got there, and how did you overcome that discomfort? Um, yeah, I, I didn't really feel much discomfort. I don't know, I quite enjoyed the process. So, yeah, I, I thought it was amazing. I, I suppose some of the discomfort was maybe how hardworking the Chinese people were. So kind of going through that process of uh, waking up at, at six in the morning, then going to class, then doing pitch practice, then doing another pitch in front of hundreds of people, get on the bus and do the whole thing again, follow up emails until two in the morning, and then just rinse and repeat for the, the whole week. Um, so. I, even now when I kind of converse with uh, European entrepreneurs, I suppose I have to wait longer for a response, but when I speak to Chinese the, the people, they always get back to me at the late hours in the morning and they always apologize for not getting back and these kind of things. And it's just so much yeah, harder work ethic, I think, that I experienced uh, in China. But I, I definitely embraced it and I actually uh, missed it when I returned home because the pace was so much slower than in China. Yeah, and I would agree with Travis. I think the most surprising thing for me was how um, comfortable I felt from the word go. Um, I think the, the hospitality you receive, not just from your fellow alumni, but from Chinese people in general, um, ma made me feel at home pretty much straight away. I mean, to, to get into the specifics, I, I went one month early and did a language course. Um, but, but frankly, I. I I don't think that, that helped too much because it was more just my, the people I was around that, that made me feel so comfortable. So, so frankly, it's not a problem at all. Can you guys tell us a little bit about your experiences there? And, uh, you know, m for many people sitting uh, here or listening to this, may not have experienced what you've experienced in your case 14 months and Travis in your case uh, one week quite intensively, but could you just tell us, you know, what were some of the most memorable moments from your time there um, that you can share? 
I would say um, probably pitching to Tencent's investment team. That was kind of the biggest thing that <laughs> was on my mind. So it was just like a, a one minute kind of one to one pitch that was a uh, very intense process. A lot of um, preparation went into that. So that was definitely um, heavy on my mind uh, during that process. Um, I would say, other than that, just experiencing the culture around that because it wasn't just purely uh, business related. We did get to see some kind of uh, events and some shows there and meet with a lot of the, the locals. So I think that really um, stuck with me, kind of meeting the local people. Yeah, I mean, again, like Travis, I, I don't really know where to start. Um, there's just so many. I mean, I, I guess from an academic perspective, the, the access you 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 get is just unimaginable. Um, you're, you're given mentors that have set up multi-million dollar companies. Um, you're meeting um, executive MBA students that have started from nothing uh, and likewise are now employing 20,000 people. Um, and you're at the same dinner table with them. You're getting access to, to the best companies in the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, I could go on from a personal perspective. I guess um, the classmates really welcome you into their lives. Um, they would take me to their home provinces. Um, I never know what I never knew what their parents did, but they were clearly very well connected because every province we went to, we'd have free hotel accommodation, free meals, um, and, and and we're really made to feel part of their lives. That leads me to my next question, Rory and Travis. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience on the programs that you went on, um, your experience with CKGSB? What was you know, the educational experience like for both of you? Yeah, it was uh, really insightful, especially the, um, the classes at the CKGSB Business School that we took part of um, each morning. Uh, it was interesting to see um, different examples of uh, US businesses that tried to enter into China and, and these kind of um, joint ventures and certain ways that companies like Coca-Cola, for example, buying certain juice companies made mistakes while trying to acquire companies and finding out these long-term strategies that you would only get that insight direct from these business experts at the uh, CKGSB. Um, that really helps. Also, Boji's um, incredible uh, expertise on pitch practice helped me to refine my pitching to investors because I've done a lot of these um, kind of entrepreneurial incubator programs and uh, weekend events and it was a completely uh, unique perspective on how to kind of communicate uh, what it was that I was selling um, and also to a Chinese audience so that was probably a highlight as well. I think for me it's the um, for the MBA program that the, the faculty are a second to none because they tend to be a, a, like Professor Leslie Young, um, someone who has been born in China and predominantly had their childhood there, but then probably gone to the US or other Western education systems to pursue their PhDs. Um, they then come back to China to pursue their academic interests. Uh, and in a class environment, you're therefore getting a mix of um, Western business pr principles with Eastern origins. So it's, it's, a, it's a really unique perspective uh, that you get to see. Um, I think an MBA to me, um, it's, it's a little bit like seeing behind the scenes of how the world works. Um, every little question you had before an MBA about a, a kind of a job role or an academic discipline that you didn't quite understand or you, you weren't confident enough to ask about in your job. Uh, an, an MBA just, just shows you behind the scenes of what's really going on in the world. And, uh, and that, that definitely increased my confidence. I was just going to say to add to Rory's point about perspective there as well. Uh, when I entered China for the first time, I was thought of it more as a Confucianist society, but learning through the business school, it's much more capitalist. And that really stood out to me, seeing that kind of dynamic the school. Speaking of guanxi, this word that means having personal connections, it's very important in a culture like the Chinese culture. Um, how have the connections that you've made throughout your course and program helped you in what you're doing now or your personal growth 
We had about 100 investors add us on WeChat through the pitching events that I remained in contact with. I filtered those down to about 40 good leads. Um, some of them I still speak to every day that have just become good friends and, and contacts, um, which has been fantastic. And then about four of them have given these uh, formal offers of investment. Um, I'd also, um, to add on to Roy's point before, the, the alumni network has been absolutely fantastic and extremely helpful. So if I post anything in the group chat or I need to get a contact, say, at Alibaba, someone will PM me and, and share with me their, their, their contacts. Um, so I made some really good friends as well. Um, LeBlanc, Leblanco, one of the uh, circular fashion companies that also raised a lot of investment after the China Start program. Um, I've been kind of connecting them with other similar companies and yeah, we go out to London and have a good time together. Or they invite me to Milan and things like this, so it's always nice to have those kind of invitations. Yeah, the, the, the network that I um, had access to whilst on the MBA program um, was extraordinary. I mean, just as a small example, um, during one of the overseas modules, I um, persuaded the school to uh, let me organize a little trip here to the United Kingdom. Um, I thought a good company to visit would probably be a creative industry company, possibly in fashion, that the UK is well known for. Um, so through the school's contacts, I reached out to Sir Paul Smith, um, and literally a week later, we were in his office in Covent Garden. He gave us two hours of his time, um, just him and six of our students. Um, think things like that were extraordinary. Uh, to this day, um, the alumni uh, contacts I, I have um, continue to help me. Um, I feel every time I'm on the ground in China, um, there's people in pretty much every city that I feel will look after me and, and help me. Um, in January, for example, I was in Shenzhen. Uh, I reached out to some classmates, one of whom works for DJI, the world's leading drone company. Um, that enabled me to have a tour around their factory, um, see what DJI are working on. Uh, it, it's these kind of things that you, you get on the program, and I think that they never leave you. I'd like to open, the, uh, open it up to questions, if that's okay. If anyone would like to ask uh, Rory or Travis some questions. Hello. What's been the biggest challenge for you um, entering China and also building bridges between the UK and China um, by understanding the different cultures? I would say the, um, the differences between um, VC investors in China and the UK was one of the biggest ones because, um, for example, if you go and pitch to a London VC investor, it's a very straightforward process usually. Um, if, if they like you, they'll give you a term sheet and that'll be kind of a, a vote of confidence. Um, but in China, there's a very different process. For example, we learned that um, the term sheet is essentially like your final contract. So they wouldn't really issue that immediately after pitching. Um, so we were thinking they, they were asking for lots more information and we're like, oh, are they really interested? Uh, are they just kind of stringers along? Do they have someone else they're interested in? Um, but it turns out that if you sign like an NDA, that's essentially the equivalent of a term sheet in the UK. And it's kind of finding this little nuance uh, differences that can help kind of ease the process once you go through that experience. But yeah, it was the, it was the culture. It's kind of the, the investors getting to know you as a person as opposed to investing just in the metrics of your business. That's the biggest one. Yeah, I, I can't really add to that because unlike Travis, I don't have any experience of, of raising money in China. I, I guess my perspective from um, working in China a little bit after my MBA, um, I, I think you, you want to do what Travis is doing and become an entrepreneur in China rather than potentially just working for a company because your competitive advantage as a foreigner who who p potentially hasn't got mastery of the language or the culture um, is, is quite difficult against lots of these sea turtles that maybe they're American-born Chinese who are returning to China who understand both cultures and languages. So I, th I think um, from a kind of Laowai um, perspective, you want to be looking at the entrepreneurial route. How has the kind of Western um, credibility amongst, yeah. let's say, a millennial audience shifted? Is there less um, kind of um, uh, kudos being a Westerner now than there would have been five years ago, and is that accelerating? Is it harder and harder for a Westerner to make a splash? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, 
I think st still to this day, you're going to get some special treatment in China. I mean, just from the fact that you're, you look a bit more unique. Um, I think being, being British gave you quite a good advantage uh, in China. There's lots of um, um, soft cultural assets that the UK has that um, Chinese people are really interested in and want to learn from. Uh, um, so I, I think um, as per what's happening to the UK now, I don't think that's particularly affecting the, um, the, the kind of the, the standing or the reputation of the UK and China, at least I hope not. But um, I think from a, a labor market perspective, uh, yeah, further t to my previous point, um, it's just much, much more competitive. Um, so as, as someone like myself that doesn't have a, an under, full understanding of Chinese culture or mastery of the Chinese language, um, it's, it's just like a simple skill set comparison. Um, you, you, you're not going to have the same advantage. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah, I suppose I can only talk about my current experience, but I can definitely say that um, there's still a level of uh, esteem and prestige for European engineering, and I think that has um, definitely made it more attractive proposition for investment for Chinese companies that um, may not have the infrastructure to invest directly into a UK company. So I would say that, yeah, they're definitely interested in someone that's connected to, say, a UK Russell Group University that still has a high level of uh, prestige in China to this day. Uh, hi, my name is Ting Zhang from uh, crayfish.io. We are the uh, first um, online marketplace to uh, help uh, business with uh, Chinese speakers, freelancing uh, workforce. I have a question for Trevor and uh, Rory and indeed for Jessica as well. Um, as you know, doing business in China nowadays, HR, finding the right people is one of the difficult challenges, most difficult challenges for foreign companies, particularly if you are small, you can't afford a very high salary and to recruit those highly skilled people. Have you uh, thought about using freelancers uh, in the UK, in China, uh, for your uh, ongoing Chinese operation, and also for Chang Kong, once you have um, helped you know, um, entrepreneurs get uh, investment, get on the track, how do you help them further with their HR challenges, finding the skills and talent later? Um, I would say yes is the simple answer. Definitely would be interested in um, hiring freelancers. Um, I think I was just particularly lucky that the core team that I employed uh, through the university, um, like Dr. Eugene Liu, my COO, that they were just um, fantastically skilled and I could bring them in full time. Um, but for certain other roles, such as kind of uh, legal and uh, marketing, I think it's sometimes better to outsource those particularly. And it's more beneficial when entering into Chinese market to get uh, Chinese specialists that understand that. Um, so I would say that would be a good avenue to go down. Yeah, yeah further, further to Travis, I think that's a great idea. So thanks for bringing it to our attention. Uh, so in terms of freelancers, we uh, at Hong Kong actually hire quite a few freelancers to help us. We don't have internal graphics team, internal video team, you know, there are lots of things that we need freelancers for and in fact we find them on this app. Um, it's, it's, it's a mini app within WeChat. Um, it's called just freelancers within WeChat if you want to know about it. But recently we are working on a case study book and we needed someone to design the cover and I found someone, uh, a, a very fantastic designer in Shanghai through this app and in a week's time he designed a cover for us. So it, things just move very quickly and you've got an app for almost anything. Um, everyone talks about China as an innovation-led economy. Um, uh, in, in the West, uh, in terms of uh, technology and uh, development of technology, especially in AI, there's a large emphasis on uh, safeguarding and uh, the public safety and ethics yeah. standards. Mm -hmm. And in China, it seems to be that um, the emphasis is more on innovation than introducing regulations. What's your views? Having studied at EMBA, what's your, what views have you developed in terms of where China is going with regulations? 
I would say that it's something that we're definitely aware of. I think there's been a lot of progress in terms of um, China's ability to protect IP. I mean, as Boji mentioned before, they file more patents than any other country, so there must be a reason why they're filing these patents unless they can <laughs> be taking things from other people. But um, uh, we, uh, our kind of company structure is that we build the core technology in the UK and then we use um, the Chinese subsidiary for kind of sales and disseminating uh, the app across the uh, Asian market. Um, the only reason for that really is because it's a much more aggressive landscape for AI. For example, if we were to employ someone, um, usually looking at about £300,000 per year uh, for that kind of high level AI um, tech because a company like Baidu or, or Alibaba will kind of snap them up. So <laughs> we find that we can find people that uh, will stay for longer, usually through uh, the university. So that's why we're kind of focusing more on, on the UK side. But I do think there's been a lot of progress in recent years for IP protection, so I'm a lot less worried than I would have been previously. Okay, well, thank you very much, Travis and Rory, for this uh, dialogue, for your di interesting discussion about your experience at Hong Kong and in China, and we wish you the best of luck with your ventures. Uh, we will be following you online, and, uh, you know, please let us know how it goes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much.